the high powered author panel. This was the most requested panel uh, out of last year, something that the, the fellow authors, our peers, wanted. But they wanted hey, women authors. I said, okay, but we're not going to call it that. I talked with Jasmine Walt, and I said, uh, no, it's this high powered authors panel. We don't care. We don't care about anybody's gender. We don't care about any of that stuff. What we care about is success. What's it take to be successful? What do you do differently? How do you achieve what you achieve? So let's, if we can go from Martha Carr over, just introduce yourself and what genre you write in. Hi, my name is Martha Carr. How about, how about the microphone? <laughs> Hi, my name is Martha Carr, and I write in um, urban fantasy, which is fantasy in a realistic setting. Hi, I'm Lindsay Baroker, and I write fantasy and science fiction. I have over 50 novels out, and I also do sci-fi romance under a pen name. Hi, I'm Michelle Matto, and I write young adult urban fantasy. Hi, I'm Izzy Shouse, and I primarily write urban fantasy. Hi, uh, I'm Jasmine Walt. Um, I kind of write under several different fantasy subgenres, so we'll just say fantasy. Uh, I've published almost 40 novels uh, in the three years that I've been doing this, and uh, yeah, that's probably all you need to know right now. <laughs> Martha, what was that one thing? What was the one thing that lifted you to that next level that showed you what was possible? It was finally getting an assistant, and it was getting an assistant and stop trying to do everything myself. And also, um, I can't see numbers, I have a learning disability, so ads were tough for me. And it was uh, admitting that and looking for somebody um, who could help me do that, and it made a huge difference. Um, and I set aside time every day to write. I still have a day job, believe it or not. And um, I work out the numbers for how many words have to be turned in and just get it done. What about you, Michelle? <laughs> So I um, initially actually started with traditional publishing, and that was rough because they actually did not pay a lot. And then um, one of my friends did indie publishing, and she let me know how well she was doing with, with indie. So that was my one thing, was seeing the success of another author and seeing the potential with this market with indie. So um, in 2016, I decided to go fully indie, and I took um, self-publishing formulas, ads for authors course, which is actually opening tomorrow. And that really taught me how to not only get my books out there, but how to get people to buy them and advertise them. So that really took me to the next level. Good to go. And, and Lindsay Baroker, she also runs a podcast, which talk about giving back. Okay, here we are, 20 Books of 50K is giving back. But Lindsay has been giving back through her podcast for a number of years. Woo! What's that one thing for you, Lindsay? It's actually just been really gradual and steady for me, continuing, continuing upward. I have probably never had like some super lucky break or blockbuster hit or anything. I think one of the big things for me was just, uh, I've mentioned on my show, it take, took me seven years to write my first novel. I, I wasn't <laughs> super dedicated to working on it every day. And uh, just getting a part of the author community and hearing about other authors like uh, Rachel Aaron's 2K to 10K book, and then hearing other people writing 10K a day. And at the time I was already full time, it was like 2012, but I was writing maybe two, 3,000 words a day. And I just, just hearing that other people could do that motivated me to write, to realize if I really sat down, I could actually do 10K in like five hours or so. And so being more prolific has just allowed me to like take the time and explore a lot of different genres, even though we know you shouldn't write cozy mysteries, you know, when you write sci-fi. <laughs> and it's just given me a lot more time to play with things and get more stuff out there and the income's become very regular. So I appreciate that. And talking about productivity, Izzy, my, uh, my personal hero for 49,000 words in one day. Wow. What's that one thing for you, Izzy? Uh, the one thing for me would definitely have to be organization. Um, when I finally figured out how to trap my life in spreadsheets, um, that really changed everything. I have spreadsheets for spreadsheets for spreadsheets now. Um, I have every single day jotted down for how many words I need to write a day to get the books I want. I also track my sprints and um, I track like my chapters completed. If I didn't meticulously track all of those things, I wouldn't be able to produce at the level that I do. Okay, how, how do you avoid burnout? <laughs> um, really, for me, I tried a lot of different ways to avoid it. 
Um, I tried following like a five day a week schedule. Um, and what I've found recently is that I cannot do a set schedule. I have to just listen to my mind and my body. And if I, I write every day, if I, my brain says, you know what, we need this day, we can't do this today. I take that day guilt free. Okay. And I know that I'll come back to it tomorrow. As long as you listen to what your body is telling you, you can avoid burnout. My body was definitely telling me not to do that 49K day, Good. and I paid for it. <laughs> What's that one thing for you, Jasmine? Uh, well, some of you might know this just from listening to me on podcasts, but I didn't, when I started writing, I actually started as a ghostwriter. Um, because I didn't feel confident. I knew that I was a good writer, but I was still not confident about the storytelling stuff. So, and, and it was like at a time when, you know, I was tired of working for someone else and I'd gotten laid off in the recession. And I was just trying to figure out what can I do? Cause I was also like taking college classes and I was, I was really young at the time. So I was doing it for years. And at some point, because it probably took like three or four years because I'm a highly intelligent female, I realized that the people who were paying me to do the ghostwriting must be making more money than what I was making. <laughs> so I decided to take a crack at the indie author thing because I was like, I knew that ghostwriting was, was only a set amount of money that I could make off my words. I could raise my rates or do whatever, but it was still like there's very much a ceiling there that doesn't exist with indie authors because when you publish a book, it makes money forever as long as you can keep marketing it. So that was what it did it for me. Okay. Let's go back to Martha. Let's talk about what do you like most about being an indie? So uh, I started in traditional land a long time ago, about 30 years ago, had agents, and um, it was unpredictable. It took a long time. Um, you get one signal and then another. I mean, I still have a book in a drawer uh, from an agent that never I never did anything with. What I like about being an indie, um, most of all, is the relationships. What I failed to mention, which I should have, is I got in, I really got into indie because I went and heard Michael Anderley talk in Austin. 90, um, I think I've said this before, 90 authors in the room, only three of us stayed to ask a question, only one of us stayed in touch. You might be able to guess who the one was. And um, because of that, I learned not only, I, I learned how to stop writing like a traditional author, and to start um, having fun. And one of the great joys of getting to know Michael and getting to know Craig and the others is the constant um, contact. And um, I also stopped wondering if I was doing it right, um, if everybody else has a bad day, if um, others have to take data when they crash and figure out what to fix. And uh, so uh, that's pretty much Let me mix up the questions a little bit. We don't want people to prepare too long. For, I was thinking uh, about my answer already, Craig. <laughs> what, what, what is your, what, what made you, what do you like best about being an indie? <laughs> I like that uh, we can get stuff to market so quickly and adapt and we can be very fast and agile. Like if a new category opens up on Amazon and subcategory or something, we can have a book in it the next month or the next six months if, uh, if for flows that will write at a more normal speed. Um, but that's what I've loved that, uh, you know, and by being there first, we can kind of take advantage and maybe two years later before the traditionally published novels start popping into that category. So that's something I really enjoyed. So my, my favorite thing about being indie is the control that we have over our own careers, because you certainly do not have that in traditional publishing, as I experienced when I was in that. Um, as indies, we can keep our backlist going for as long as we want. So I have a box set that has been out for two years, and I'm consistently running ads to that and making money off of it. Whereas in traditional publishing, if your book flops within like a week, they don't put any money in advertising behind it, and they just let it go forever. So I just like that I'm able to control my own career and have a say in what I'm doing and what I'm writing. So I'm able to write the genre that I love instead of the genre that traditional wanted me to write, which is great. Uh, so I am a control freak. Um, I do not like not having a say in things. Um, I did not like the idea that someone would change parts of my book or get the cover wrong, um, but Primarily, it boiled down to no one is ever going to care about your book as much as you do. And I knew that I was the only one who could give my book its best chance. 
And uh, so that's what I love about being indie is that I know 110% goes into giving my book what it needs. And I just don't trust anyone else to do that. <laughs> Everybody has all these like business-minded answers. For me, it's just that I love to be able to work wherever I want, whenever I want. Uh, I've always really wanted to travel, and um, you know, I was never able to do that before. And anybody who follows me on Facebook or Instagram knows that <laughs> I do quite a lot of it these days. So for me, like what I love about being an indie is that it gives me the freedom to live the life that I want to live, and not a life that's stuck in a cubicle or based on a certain set amount of hours. Like Izzy said, it's like you can work when your creative juices are flowing. You don't have to force yourself if you really need to take a mental health day or something like that. So for me, I, it's like it's really been good for my soul personally. Let's let's stay with Jasmine for this one because Jasmine asked about uh, about this. What is the difference <clears throat> that you realize once you uh, move to a new level of success? What are the challenges that come with that higher level of success? Hmm. That is a good one. Uh, I mean, it's kind of funny because I didn't start out as like somebody who was making like, you know, 97 cents a day. Um, I got lucky in that like, I watched what people were doing for a long time and my first book made me like, you know, $10,000 in 30 days. So I didn't have that like thing where you were networking with people for a long time and then you're gradually building up and understanding the industry. So I know there are a couple of people like that who all of a sudden, like you went from you know, working at Walmart or something or a nine to five job and all of a sudden you're making a lot of money and all of a sudden you have people looking at you and asking you for advice and, and expecting you to be like an opinion leader and like know things. And <laughs> you have to know things apparently when you're successful. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, so it's been a learning experience for me just because um, I find that the indie community is really great on a personal level. I love coming to these conventions and I love talking to people one on one and I think that's great but you have to remember when you're sort of at the top or you know I'm not at the top top but I'm up there people see me that people see what you put out there and people don't know like what you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis and they don't know what's going through your head when you make a decision. Uh, when you make mistakes, like, you know, we've had a lot of drama this year with trademarking and, you know, uh, running giveaways and doing like things that people think might not be like kosher. And first of all, that's pretty subjective. I'm not gonna get into what I think is good or bad. Um, but I think you have to remember when you look at people at the top that we're all still experimenting and it's like, we make mistakes. Like don't take everything that we say as gospel because we definitely are still growing as an industry. Like most of us, like we got Michael Anderley over there who's like a born digital marketer. <laughs> like that was not me. Um, and a lot of people forget that kind of thing. I don't know, is there anything else you want to do? <laughs> What do you think? It, what do you think is it? I'm a human being, just so you know. I, I'm not a robot. I know that I can write five to eight thousand words a day, but I'm still human. We all make mistakes, and it's important to remember that when you're talking to us and when you come to us for advice, that you know you need to like really double check and make sure that like it's not just us who are saying this, like like that it really does work. What about you, Izzy? What changed? Um, so, like Jasmine, um, I don't really know the uh, the exact challenges that people face when they're um, when they're first starting out and doing the climb. Because my first book, Brave Mistake, you know, launched really high and made ten thousand dollars in its first thirty days too. Uh, so I really went from zero to sixty. But if I compare the challenges at zero to the challenges at sixty, I would definitely say that it's pressure. Um, there's a lot of pressure uh, that I see when I sit down at my computer to start writing where sometimes I'll just realize that a lot of people are reading my books and oh my god what if I get this one word wrong <laughs> and this has to be perfect what if it can't be perfect and then I realize I've been sitting at the keyboard for an hour and haven't typed a word and then you just kind of have to sit back and remind yourself you didn't think about any of this when you were writing your first book you just wrote it and they loved it. And you just have to let go of that and remind yourself of that so that you can write. 
But that pressure really is the biggest challenge change for me that I've dealt with. So I come from a very different spot from Jasmine and Izzy because I had eight years of struggle before one of my book series took off. Um, as I mentioned, I started in trad, and before that I actually had tried indie, didn't do so well on it, then went on to trad, that didn't do well. Then I returned to indie, and <laughs> my first five books I re released indie did not do well at first. So I was really actually frustrating because I was trying so hard and just trying to make, you know, that ten thousand first 10,000 in a month. Um, but I kept learning and I kept trying to figure out how it could make it work for me. I'm also not a person who can write so many words in a day. So I can write about 1,200 to 1,500 words a day maximum. And I still manage to do this full time. So you don't have to always be a book word counter. Like that's great if you are, but there are so many other ways you can be successful and find what works for you. So I had to figure out what worked for me. And this, like writing 1,200 to 1,500 words a day keeps me from burning out. And again, I had a lot to learn about advertising to make my books take off because <laughs> it did not happen initially. And I had to learn all about marketing. I did not come from like a business major background. I was an English major, so I didn't really know that much about advertising and marketing when I got into this. And advertising is what made my books take off. That's how I had to do it because Amazon just didn't push my books for me. Who knows why, they just didn't. Um, and I think the hardest thing actually is that once you start reaching the goals that you've set for yourself, you get really happy for like a day, but then you set a new goal. Um, so it's like you can never actually get to the place you wanna be because there's always something more you can be doing or a new goal you can be reaching. So it's kind of you know just trying to learn to be happy where you are, but also setting those new goals because that is important to always wanna reach that next level. All right, I think my first uh, publication was a children's short story that I believe I sold about $30 worth the first month, and only because I bribed people on keyboards, if you buy my book, I'll buy yours, which is not cool, you shouldn't do it, I didn't know, but like, I think everybody starting out new is just like, how, how can I make the Amazon algorithm sell my book, I don't know. But uh, I had a very, uh, you know, a slower gradual climb, so I think that that makes it a little easier. I, I actually feel like when you have the overnight success, it's sort of stressful. <laughs> You're like, what do I do with the next book? How do I keep it going? Uh, I do think that one thing that's hard now is just trying to keep it up. There's, you know, we hear about there's more competition, and more books on Amazon, you know. And I, I feel fortunate that I got to the point where I, you know, I own my house, I own all my stuff outright, so I feel like I don't have to make as much money. But uh, it, it's a, certainly nice, you always have these goals, you know, you're like, well, it'd be kind of nice to beat that one year or something like that. But um, I, I just, uh, you know, I didn't have any super stressful <laughs> experience. I'm pretty much the same person. I just own my stuff out right now. <laughs> so I had a 30 year gradual climb and I think I'm easily the oldest person up here. And, um, I ran into the right people and was, uh, when I ran into Anderley and asked him questions and he kept answering them, um, I told myself that I was just gonna say yes to whatever idea he had. And there's also a running story. He said, you wanna do a series together. I still say he said, you wanna do a universe. And for some reason he didn't stop me. So um, I had a lot of time. To, I used to be, well, I used to be a journalist for a long time. I wrote a national column. I had a lot of experience with um, do you want to be a writer even if it's not really paying? And I'd answered that question, so that wasn't the issue. And um, so when I got the chance to find out if I could actually be an, a, a writer who makes money, um, I was on board to see what I, what I could do to change, and there was a lot that I was doing wrong and didn't know it. And what's interesting, too, is I had great agents. They didn't know either, clearly. And, and so uh, when I became an indie is when I really started to learn. So I, this summer I bought my dream house because of what changed. And last weekend, Anderly said I had a pretty woman weekend because I walked into a furniture store and bought everything I needed all at once. So uh, I bring this up too for everybody who's sitting out there who maybe is starting, I'm 59. And so if uh, it has nothing to do with your age, I can't write like as fast as I could when I was in my 30s, but I started making money in my 50s. And um, I agree um, with uh, what Michelle was saying that uh, you gotta be you, do you. Whoever you are, whatever you're writing, um, so that's what we need to hear. And um, I am super impressed with people who can do um, those huge days and admire it. 
I don't, but that's never going to be me. And it, that's okay. It's all working out fine. I mean, I'm having a great time. I do see what uh, Martel posts on Facebook, and I do have a moment of, oh, I'd love to beat him. And <laughs> then I realize that's not reality. And then I go back to saying, you know, how can I add to this picture and um, make it better and have some fun along the way? If you're not having fun, you're really, you're, you're doing it wrong and talk to some of us. And that's, that's the other element too is, I have a core group of people who know me, who know the reality, who um, can kind of remind me of it uh, and um, help me figure out like where to go next, how to grow. So um, the coolest thing, you know, I held this dream for 30 years. And all of a sudden I went past it because of um, Michael Anderley and Judith sitting next to him. So now I find I don't really actually have a, well, I do have a goal, that's a big fat lie. <laughs> Wherever Felicia is, she's thinking she, yeah, she's lying. So we're going for um, $250,000 a month is our goal. And, but, you know, but I'm also not attached to it. I'm having fun today. So if we don't reach it, we'll still be super happy because we'll be in the range. But the, you know, it's what we're in, because we have a goal, we know what we need to do in order to even have a chance of getting there. And if you know, if you just showed up to the party, so did I. And uh, you can, I know you can do it. It's going to be a question of data and the people surrounding you and whether or not you just are willing. That's what I became was willing. And I think that's the biggest change. I think if I'd been younger, I would have argued my way out of the door. And instead, I just kept saying yes. Whatever, I, I clearly don't know, so I'm just gonna keep saying yes and try it your way. We'll find out if it works, and it did. <laughs> there was a second half that I'd forgotten to say, so now that everyone else has had a chance to talk, I'll say it now. Because I was talking about kind of from you to me, but like what you, that what you see when you look at people like us and the fact that we make mistakes. But from the end of someone who makes mistakes, um, the, thing, the thing is is that when we go into this industry and we realize that like there's all these people and all these friends to make and all these things to learn, and we realize that we want everybody to like us, and the fact is is that when you become successful, not everybody is gonna like you. Like it's just, it doesn't matter what industry it is, it doesn't matter if it's like mechanics or like if we're in engineering or writing or art or anything, there's always gonna be somebody who doesn't like the way you're doing what you're doing or they don't like that you publish like four books a month or they don't like that you make, you know, $100,000 a year only publishing four or they don't think that the way that you market is the way that they would do it. And like Michael often says, there's more than one way to climb the mountain and it's really important to remember that, you know, obviously you gotta be ethical and you gotta be legal, but don't, don't worry about what other people think about the way you're climbing your mountain. Because all that matters is the readers. Like, I love you guys, but you guys don't pay my bills. Like, you just don't. It's the readers that pay your bills and they're, they're the ones who matter. If you're alienating your readers, that's a problem. But if you're making your business decisions based off what other writers are gonna think about you, you're never gonna get anywhere because t writers will talk and they'll say what they want, but they don't pay your bills. So that's my other piece of advice. That networking still is important. Like I think it's very important to like, you know, make other author friends and work together. I found that working together with other authors, especially in the beginning, was so important for me to learn more and to climb that mountain. Let's, uh, let's take a look at what is your favorite book and why Martha Carr. This is somebody else's book that inspired you, shall we say. Uh, so uh, the book that inspired me to finally write the first book um, was Sophie's Choice by William Styron, something about the way he wove those stories together. And um, that was back when I was making almost nothing and I was a single parent. And I yelled out literally out loud to the universe, if you want me to keep writing, I'm gonna need a sign. And I got an invitation to the Virginia State Library's opening and William Styron was the speaker. Underneath, it was my cousin's name. I didn't know that William Styron and, and his mother, my cousin, grew up together. So I went down there early and talked my way in using my cousin's name so I could sit in the front row. And um, if that wasn't enough, I, when I went through the line, of course I dropped my cousin's name. And he asked me what book I wrote. I told him the title, and he said, good book, I read it. 
still chokes me up, and this is 30 years later, and it's, um, I just thought the universe answered. I really, whoever out there is doubting which yourself being able to do this, I, I am your like person you should look at. I've had cancer seven times. I was a single mother. I lost every, I lo there was a point where I was actually working on a book that I was getting paid to do, but it, the economics of the great uh, recession, I realized that I didn't really have an address for that, for that little stretch of time. And, um, uh, I didn't have a car either, and um, I just kept going. I believed in myself. I had enough people who believed in me that, um, and I had found a grant that would pay for the, uh, at first, when I was first diagnosed, I was told I was terminal. I swore to Craig I wouldn't do that again and crash the whole thing by. Here we are. But here we are. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and can you imagine if I had given up? I, so I saw Andrew Lee's thing that this, there was this guy giving a speech that um, <laughs> he had made 30,000, I think the first six months in fiction. And I honestly was going to see if he was legit and maybe he had a thing or two I could learn from it. But can you imagine if I'd said, you know, I've been doing this 30 years, it's never gonna happen, I'm giving up today. And um, I wasn't gonna ask him a question because I, 90 authors, I thought they're gonna rush him. And I turned around and saw two old guys standing up there. I thought, yeah, I'm going too. <laughs> and, um, and then was bold enough to say, what, what's your email address? What's your phone number? And he gave it to me. <laughs> and um, then to just keep calling. And then when he said, do you want to try some? I was writing thrillers and not doing well at it. He said, uh, what do you want to do? Do you want to? And I said, urban fantasy. And so off we went. And this, that was two years ago. So I went from at one point back in 2008 of having no furniture, being diagnosed terminal cancer. I was actually quite overweight at the time too. I mean, it was quite the picture. And uh, I, I bought a dream house and I just filled it with furniture. And um, I'm having the time of my life. I can honestly tell you I'm having the time. And it's also because of all the people I hear from um, I constantly, we get a lot of vets who like to read what we write because we, we, we may swear a lot. <laughs> and also, it's funny. And they, it, they, they say that um, our swearing troll helps them with their PTSD or just some story we wrote. I'm having the time of my life. Do not give up. Keep going. If you're stuck, find one of us. Ask a question. Somebody's going to tell you something that will unlock whatever it was you were looking for. And remember, I believe in you. I know Michael believes in you just as much. I know Craig does. We honestly believe that everybody in here has the potential to do it. It's going to be who keeps going. Right. <laughs> so the question was, your favorite book is? <laughs> Play and Star and Sophie's Troy. <laughs> Continuing on with the favorite book question. <laughs> I did, well, Martha was talking. I, I did want to make the point, and I think that w if you're in a place where you're motivated and you can really find some really great motivation and you want to change your life, you just want things to be better, that's like the best driving force you will ever have to, to just write and succeed and, and make your dream work some way. You know, it's actually if you just kind of chill, you know, I already make 500000 a year. I kind of like my job, you know. It's a little harder to, to find that drive, so I guess be grateful <laughs> that you, you had a reason to be so motivated. My favorite book. <laughs> uh, I was actually really, as a sci-fi fantasy person, was really inspired by uh, Lois McMaster Bujold's Borkosigan series. She's got kind of a non-standard hero. He's really smart, but he's crippled. He has these kind of weak bones and stuff because his mother was attacked during the war. But uh, I just love that it's such a quirky character and a non-standard superhero. Not that we have anything against superhero genre and superhero people, but. I love that he's very, she, her books are very, uh, there's a lot of humor in them. He has to scheme his way out of things because he can't just do Captain Kirk and fling himself into the bad guys and win. And so I, I just loved her quirky style, made me realize, oh, my sci-fi does not have to be serious. Because I kind of started before Firefly and I had Star Trek as a, a model and there was always humor in those, but I think uh, reading science fiction, especially as a girl, you know, there are a few female authors out there certainly, but. The impression I had is it has to be like really tacky, really serious. That, you know, we gotta spend two pages defining how this ship has artificial gravity. So I, I just really appreciated that, and I, I can see a lot of my her humor and my stuff, or my humor and her stuff. So I hope to meet her someday so I can thank her. 
So, my favorite book is Twilight by Stephanie Meyer. Not to be too basic, but I mean, it is what it is. Um, so I read Twilight when it first came out, and I feel like Twilight kind of really changed the entire young adult genre, because before it, you know, it was Sweet Valley Twins and Sweet Valley High and all of that other stuff, and Twilight is what started the supernatural craze in YA. And I loved that because I used to have to go to the adult romance section when I was in sixth grade to get like those books about vampires and werewolves and stuff. So I was really excited as a teen to find that there were you know books for my age that had um, you know the creatures that I liked. And now of course young adult has expanded to having I think even more adult fans than teens at this point. But after I read. Twilight, I started to write fan fiction for Twilight because I loved the book so much. And that's what kind of got me back into writing again and realizing that you know, this might be something I could do because I was writing about these other characters that Stephanie Meyer had created in her world and it made me realize that I could potentially write about characters and worlds I had created and characters I could create. And so I decided to give it a go from that. Uh, so my favorite book, um <laughs> my favorite book uh, wasn't necessarily the, um, there wasn't really any one book that launched me into the I want to write phase. Um, I've been writing since I was like three, four years old. I have a little picture squirrel book that I tied together. Uh, that was the first book I wrote. It's ridiculous. Uh, but so that's kind of always been in me, but there was one book that really launched me into I could write urban fantasy, I could write fantasy kind of books that resonate with me. Um, it wasn't an urban fantasy book, it was a young adult uh, high fantasy book. It was Tamara Pierce's Alana the Lioness. I was in like third grade um, and it just, it really touched me because it's, um, it's a book about a girl who doesn't want to embrace her magic. She wants to be a knight and she's in a world where she can't do that. And so it's kind of like, it, it's a Mulan, a Mulan story. Um, but it was just really empowering to see this female lead character go after what she wanted and change all the rules. And it made me think, I could write books like this. I could actually do this. Um, so that's, that's my favorite book. Uh, so... I feel like saying that I have a favorite book is like saying, like, well, who's my favorite child? So I'm not gonna do that because it's too hard. But um, I, um, I actually, it's weird because I grew up reading both fantasy, like hardcore, like fantasy and romance because I was introduced to fantasy as a kid, but then I had a period where I was living with my mother, and the only books that I had in the house were these Harlequin paperback <laughs> romances that I was reading at 14 years old. So, <laughs> so uh, that led me into paranormal romance, and I really love paranormal romance because, um, like, the heroines actually get to like do things, and there's magic, and like there's cool stuff, and it's they're not just being taken along for the ride; they get to control the ride somewhat. Um, but one thing that was always frustrating to me in romance is that a lot of the times, or really in a lot of books, a lot of the times, like, and, and I realize now that this is actually writers do this on purpose. I realize this as a reader. But, like, characters will get themselves into situations and you'll be like, why did you do that? You're stupid. Like, <laughs> don't do that thing. Like, you know, when you're on the screen, you're watching a horror movie and they're about to, like, go into the graveyard and you're like, don't, just, just don't go in there. So... <laughs> I wanted to write a book where like the heroine like didn't hold her tongue and she didn't like, uh, I mean it's kind of weird because my heroine actually does do a lot of stupid things, but she's the heroine that charges in and does them instead of like holding herself back or like doing what other people tell, tell, tell her to do. And if like somebody says something stupid, she's gonna call them out even, if the, even though that person like could probably kill her. So. I wanted to write that book because growing up as a teenager, you have so many times when you have adults that like tell you that what to do and how to do it, and you have to hold yourself back. And uh, that was the Bane Chronicles, and I got a, it was weird because I got a lot of heat. Like either people loved Sunaya, because she thought like, she's like this great, this no filter like girl who just goes after what she wants, or they hated her. And they were like, she's like, she can't like just like keep a level head. But I wanted to write, because 
because I feel like there are a lot of male characters that are like hot-headed and take charge and this and that, uh, but women are expected to be more like <clears throat> responsible. Um, they're expected to be more responsible. And, and you're saying this in front of Michael Anderley? <laughs> well, you know, I hadn't read his book at the time. I think we came out roughly around the same time. But anyway, that was what inspired me. I wanted to write a female who was a little more of a hothead, like, go for it kind of thing. And since then, I've changed a little bit on how I write my female characters because I don't actually want half of my readers to hate my character. But, <laughs> yeah, that's what Okay, we have five minutes left, and now we have uh, nine-year-old Callie Lawson, published two books with, I think, I think five more in the mix. What's some advice the all-star team here would give her for her career? Um, She's nine. Make sure you're having fun. Uh, make sure you have a balanced life, and you're getting to hang out with your friends, and uh, just keep going. Don't drink too much at the bar tonight. <laughs> I agree that it's important to have fun and to make time. I go hiking with my dogs every morning and play tennis, and I, I got to like consciously make myself get off the computer and get out of the house, and so it's have hobbies, have friends, go out and do things. Don't get so wrapped up, in, especially when you start to have some success. You're like motivated. I want to write more. I got to get more out. I got five books this month I got to publish. So keep it balanced. So my biggest piece of advice would be to read a lot. I think that has helped me greatly as an author. I read probably about 80 to 100 books a year. And I find that by reading a ton, I'm able to understand story structure, to understand what the readers want. And when you read, make sure you're reading books that are selling well in the genre that you want to write so that you'll just understand, like it'll be ingrained into your head what you need to do with your own books and never lose that joy for reading because I think that the joy for reading is what also makes us want to create stories of our own. And I just think it's important to always hold on to that. Uh, so the most important piece of, piece of advice that I could give her would be um, the same advice that I try to give myself. And that is do not ever let anyone take away your spark. Like that spark inside of you that pushes you to create and you know change things inside the world that you're, that you're making and you're working in that spark that drives you is precious and society will try to beat it out of you and don't let them hold on to that spark because it's what's going to take your books from okay to amazing and life changing for people to read. Hold on to that spark because you need it to live. Um, just, just don't lose it. Uh, so I'll go off what Michelle Mano was saying about reading, but specifically, I think, especially at a young age, it's important, um, like, especially if you're writing fantasy, like history, like knowing your history is really important. A lot of writers get a lot of inspiration from like real world events like wars and politics and all that kind of stuff that really enriches world building. You learn that from history. And I mean, history can be boring depending on who's teaching it, but like if you're not like if you're not a textbook kind of person, uh, John Green has a, a YouTube series called Crash Course. So like if you're not if you're weak on your history, he, his series is really fun. There's lots of visuals and stuff like that. But I think that um, as writers, uh, definitely like if I could change my education, I definitely would have gone on a more of a history bent as a kid. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I have run us too long. Uh, my intent was to uh, allow about 10 minutes for questions. I've run us too long. So let's hear a round of applause for Martha Carr. We're going to be open. Uh, Thank you, Charles and Jasmine Bell. They'll be here all uh, for the whole conference. Uh, stop and talk to them. N not in the bathroom, though. No. Any place else.